thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, panelists. Um, some of you, it's very early in the morning. For some, it's very late at night. So I really appreciate all of you tuning in and, and being online. Uh, this is the ISHC roundtable session on how to make the most of your downtime. And essentially, if we were to put some quotes on these sessions, this would be the one when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. So we're going to take a um, pragmatic but a positive approach to the current situation. And we're going to talk through some of the strategies that you can be applying now so that we will come out of the downturn um, stronger. My name is Thea Ross. I am the Managing Director of Strategic Hotel Consulting based in Switzerland. I am also a member and a board member of the International Society of Hospitality Consultants, which is essentially a leading source for hospitality expertise globally. We've got about 239 members at this moment, to be precise in 28 different countries. So it is truly um, a very international organization and represented by the absolute best of the best within the field of consultancy. Um, in terms of the panelists that we have today, I'm going to, to talk or introduce you briefly. And if I can ask you then to, to give a little wave or so as I, I speak about you, so everybody knows who you are. So it's a very international panel we have today. We have um, Alan Benjamin, the president of Benjamin West, joining us from uh, United States, from Colorado. Um, we have Gert Nordsti, the um, managing director of Northside Consulting Company, based in Macau, China. So right in the opposite end of the, the time zones. Um, Bruno Walter, Managing Director of Prato Consulting, based in Innsbruck in uh, Austria. Uh, we have Darlene Henke, um, President and CEO of Audit Logistics, also from the United States in Colorado. And we have Peter Jönk, uh, partner at Joy Design from Hamburg in Germany. I will be referring to, to Peter as Peter from now onwards to keep things uh, sort of user friendly for our international audience. So, so what we're going to be doing today is that we're going to talk through um, the current situation, both from the professional as well as from the personal side of things. So we're going to discuss how you can better make use of the time that we currently have. Um, from the professional side, we look at more things like CapEx, FF&E, um, planning and strategizing, HR training. And then we will also discuss the, the personal side of things. How can you as an individual make good use of this time so that you can then come out of it stronger mm. um, or at least survive. So just as a little sort of housekeeping point before we get started. We do have this um, session chat on the right hand side here. So if I can ask you to um, put any questions there if you have questions and we'll try to, to go through them as we as we go through the session. So I'd like to kick off by talking about the professional effects on this and, and let's start with um, with capital expenditure. Now we are living in a situation at the moment where cash is king. I think nobody disagrees with that. And that has led some owners to think that this might be a, a time to employ some of their capital reserves to do renovations um, in their properties since many of the properties are closed. Um, I'm going to throw this to you, Alan, um, because it's early in the morning and you're bright and ready to go. So. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what, what do you see as what, what's the latest pulse of the industry in relation to CapEx projects? Um, do you see that owners are proceeding as before or are they kind of bringing projects forward or postponing them? What, what's your take on it? Well, the quick answer would be all the above. I mean, overall, uh, and we do more than 300 hotel projects a year in, in 40 countries. Most of them are based in the Americas, but I also have a, a London office. so. We are working globally, but a vast majority of our projects are continuing. Um, when you look at, we started this uh, 
business cycle, I guess you could call it, with a tremendous uh, pipeline of projects. CapEx was at a record spend uh, 18 and 19, and even January and February of this year were ahead of January and February of last year. Obviously, there's been um, you know a massive amount of, of change just in the last month, which it seems like it's been a year ago, but it's only a month ago. Um, because most of our projects last anywhere from 18 to 36 months, uh, most owners are letting existing orders proceed. Um, some owners that are in a cash preservation mode, and Tia, you're very right that cash is king could probably be the theme of this, probably all of March and all of April for probably some of pay for our industry. Um, some owners that are in a cash preservation mode are allowing ff &E to ship and then uh, be stored in a warehouse, not hiring the general contractor, or called the main contractor, to do the uh, demo and the installation. Um, to your question, a lot of owners are using the lesson of 08 and 09, where they are actually accelerating projects, projects that were scheduled for 21 or 22. They're going, hey, let's do it now. Um, you don't worry about your guest satisfaction or GSS score because, one, there's not that many guests in the hotel if your hotel is still open. And two, for the small amount of guests that are there, you can add a second or third kind of buffer floor between any of the noise and, and dust and disruption of a renovation. And then you don't, again, worry about displacement of revenue because you don't have that much revenue, if at all, to displace. So it is a great time to renovate if the owner has the balance sheet and the cash to do it, and they're going to own that asset for the next you know, four, five, six, seven years anyway. Um, Generally speaking, our industry always recovers faster than people think it will, especially when you're in the, the depth of it like we are now. And you want to capture all those precious dollars you can in the recovery and not have any displacement of revenue once that recovery comes. Yeah, quite right. So you touched on something very important there, which is basically if you have access to the materials or labor or you're able to do these things. So, um, Carlene, I'm going to talk to you a, a little bit about this because you're you're the logistics guru, so you, you know everything about what's open, what's not open in the world. Um, how has the transportation industry been impacted by the, the sort of current restrictions and how much is there actually availability, access to the materials for owners to renovate and do CapEx? Thank you. That's a that's a great question. Um, so to talk about the supply chain a little bit, um, we're, we're seeing a lot of different effects um, to, to start out internationally with the different ports. Um, we're seeing, at least here in the United States, the, the U.S. has taken the approach that vessels coming from overseas, especially China, are still allowed to dock into the ports in the U.S. Um, as long as no crew members aboard the ships um, are carrying any sort of fever or symptoms of the coronavirus. Um, and if they've left China within 14 days, for countries like Vietnam, which recently just got put on lockdown um, for the last 14 days, they're taking a slightly different approach where um, once the vessels are arriving in Vietnam, they're being required to sit outside the port for 14 days, and they're requiring that all the crew members are tested. So that's causing a, a slight delay with goods um, being able to be picked up and, and shipped abroad. Uh, much like the airlines, the steamship lines for all over the world are reducing their capacity because there's less product flowing through them. So we have seen rates primarily stay steady for the, the most part as far as international shipping um, for now, um, with the exception of air freight. Uh, a lot of merchandise that has to be air freighted or put a lot of times on passenger planes. And, and like I mentioned, with the airlines pulling back capacity, it's making um, air freight opportunities out of China or Vietnam either extremely expensive or if you can even get the available space. Um, once the goods arrive into the U.S., uh, we're not really seeing too much of a delay on the on the transportation side with over-the-road trucks. Um, there are some trucking companies that are being uh, designated to only sp uh, supply essential goods, but in the United States, there's enough trucking capacity that it's not slowing down the the transport of FF&E or OS&E into any of the um, areas. One thing that's interesting about the United States is that the um, government is letting each state make their own policy as to what areas are shelter in place or where people aren't allowed to leave their homes. So one of the challenges that we're facing in the U.S. is when goods are available to pick up from the manufacturers, um, say, for instance, if the goods are coming out of the state of Georgia, 
um, and shipping into California, we're actually having to check with each local community and each jurisdiction to ensure that they are allowing goods to travel in if, if they're not essential goods. Um, right now, our company has a little over 350 active projects um, shipping into warehouses or job sites at the current moment. And right now we're, we're seeing a limited disruption. There may be a, a handful where the job sites are shut down or in places like um, Boston, they're not allowing trucks to transport goods in unless they're non-essential. Um, and so we're, we're really starting to kind of, you know, see that happen in more pockets across the U.S. instead of it being um, a broad-based problem. Um, right now, if you go to the gas station in the United States and you buy um, gas for your car, everybody's commenting on how cheap gasoline prices are, which is fantastic because even though we're seeing a slight uptick in trucking costs um, with fuel costs being low, that's that's helping keeping it maintained. Um, but we do sort of anticipate that when we start to get past this and things loosen up and people are allowed to travel more, um, that we are going to potentially see costs go up. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, I'm going to ask Peter about this. Um, in relation to, it's, a, it's an interesting point about this cost factor, because on one hand, there's been this discussion that costs would be going up. On the other hand, there's been the take on things. Maybe now is the time when you can go to your vendors and try to negotiate better deals, because not that many people are in a position to do that. Um, Peter, you, as a designer, you're obviously working with a lot of suppliers. Do, do you think this is a time to be going to, to your vendors and, and renegotiating contracts? Uh, maybe I can answer the, the question a little later and, and just uh, highlight a little bit the European situation, which might be different to the American one, what Alan and, and Darlene said. Um, first of all, I don't think that so many of our hotel owners have the cash to do renovations now. We just have one who wants to speed up and close the hotel now and be ready when the, when the, the situation picks up. Uh, all the others... Um, go slow and and don't want to open a hotel now which then they have to close again um so that's that's different and also we do not have a problem like the us with go any goods but we have a problem with labor because lots of the labor in in europe come from the eastern part of europe or even further and so as the borders are closed for for people uh, they couldn't get in uh, and that that's a problem yeah. uh, here for for our building sites yeah uh, the question whether we should negotiate now as i said difficult because most of our clients do not think of speeding up we currently have a, a big project in in munich uh, at the airport a, a huge hotel so they do the tender um but still they are not sure whether they want to start renovation now or whether they postpone it to next year. Uh, of course, it, everybody knows it would be, would be much more, it would, would be more clever to do it now because you don't, do not disturb any, your guests. Um, but the cash flow is a, it's always a problem in, in Europe, I think in, in most of the projects. So yeah, yeah. yes, you should keep a, a positive uh, uh, relation with, with the vendors and uh, try to give them um a little yeah symbol line on the horizon to say the projects are just on hold they are not killed they are not dead so there will be new projects but to use the current situation to get better prices for me would not doesn't feel right yes you probably get better prices because they are all desperately looking for new jobs um but when they when the work comes to execution, um, they might already uh, need more money to, to do the jobs properly. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, let's talk a little bit about the planning and, and strategy side of business. We had earlier this morning a, a really good session from Dr. Paul Stoltz, and one of the, the quotes that he said was that now is the time to write your own story. And I really liked that one because I thought that's uh, it's a very relevant for, for individuals as it is for companies. So... Bruno, I'm gonna throw this uh, throw this to you because I know you have a very um, hands-on type of consulting practice, and you help people through the uh, process and, and to implementation. Um, what's your feel about using this time now to to develop your strategy and uh, sort of 
pull out the old marketing plans and, and dust them off and, and rewrite the whole thing. Is this the right time for to be doing this sort of um, strategic planning? Tia, yeah, I think definitely it is. Uh, the time For the first time, we have time. And I think this means we should make the best use of that time and, and simply by looking what will be after the crisis. Most likely what we will see a significant change in travel behavior or other way around, who will start first traveling? I think what we will see first will be the domestic traveler. That means the one who lives in your country and is now all of a sudden allowed to travel. When we look from, from an Austrian perspective, uh, we started relatively early attacking the crisis and are now relatively early to, to reopen again. And the first what will happen is that by mid of May, it is expected that the majority or at least a relative large portion of hotels are allowed to open again. That means it's the time now to, to address your customers, your guests. And here now, I think you really have the, the biggest advantage when you have a good relationship to your guests, when you know your guests from the past, but most likely this will be your guests in the future. So rewriting the marketing concept addressing local local markets uh, within the vicinity of 300, 500, up to maximum 1,000 kilometers, I think will be appropriate because we have to keep in mind when will flights operate again? When will flights to 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 holiday destinations will operate again? So the first people you can attract are those who, who can reach you in a recent time over the weekend, etc., because the demand for travel will be there. So rewriting the storybook now, your marketing concept is a definite good time and is definitely not a waste of time and money. Yeah, okay. So basically, the, the thing we've learned so far is that this is a very good time to be looking after your suppliers and to be looking after your guests. So kind of focus on that relationship building so that you can come out of it a bit stronger once things are good again. Um, Gerd, I want to speak to you a little bit about how do you see this, um, let's say, capitalizing on opportunities at the moment. You're obviously based in, in Macau, so things started to go bad for you a little bit earlier than for us in Europe or in America. So, so what do you see in terms of new opportunities emerging from this? Um, are you seeing entrepreneurs that are already kind of... Uh, digging deep and thinking this is this might be a once in a lifetime opportunity to to launch into something new and um, and and do things different what, what are you seeing from here yeah thank you tia so first of all i i realistically don't think that i will be able to travel anywhere because all the borders from macau to anywhere are closed uh, having said that uh, there are a group of entrepreneurs um, launching a new hotel concept in the philippines and they see this as a perfect time actually to use um, the six or eight months ahead of us in order to develop their strategy, uh, develop the branding, etc., and be ready to run out of the gates as soon as uh, domestic travel starts to um, uh, uh, loosen up, right? Uh, at the same time, and this is very cool, and I didn't expect that, but it's happening, a project somewhere in the Caribbean, and it looks like the first 18 months of the, the project, I would be managing from... Uh, the same place I'm sitting at right now. Uh, the design phase, of course, as Peter will uh, contest, can be ver done very well from home. Um, Kickoff meeting and, and project review meetings can all be done via Zoom. Then, of course, you have the problem of uh, construction, where you need a lot of people on the construction side. And the solution that we're envisaging is to uh, move the whole construction to a factory and uh, building type. So that means... Uh, from start to 18 months into the project, I would not have to move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And you think it's it's uh, it's feasible? It's a viable way to 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 work and move forward with projects. It's a little bit more challenging, of course, because doing a kickoff meeting with uh, 20 core consultants in the same room for two days uh, that is very effective. It's very hard to do a brainstorm, of course, for 20 people over Zoom. Uh, so it will be it will have to be broken down. Um, it's a little bit more time consuming, of course, but what is the alternative? The alternative is that we wait a year and that would mean a massive opportunity cost because if you overlap the duration of this crisis, six or 12 months and the total duration of the project, uh, by the time that the resort is uh, ready to be launched, that crisis is already over and we still need two years. Mm 
So I, I, I think the uh, the upsides uh, outweigh the downsides. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the HR and the the sort of employee training matters of things um, obviously we're in a situation where a lot of people at the moment have lost their jobs and even more will be losing their jobs um, companies are having to make very difficult measures and uh, there are there's been various ways of, of communicating that some better than others um, Peter I'm going to throw this to you because I, I know you've been in this industry for a long time so you've been through a, a couple of downturns yourself um, what, what's your sort of um, take on how do you manage these kind of situations with your teams what what are the the measures that are necess necessary and how do you communicate that to your teams yeah um, actually I, I due to my age I already uh, uh, survived two two downturns um, the hardest one was 9-11, um, when I fell in receivership afterwards, because I um, tried to keep all my stuff and uh, was always believing in, in what I've heard, that uh, new jobs will come and, uh, and uh, the principle of hope um, was kept the, the, the company going, uh, but not for a long time. And uh, the, if, if you do not react quick in a larger office like ours is with 40 people you have huge cost block compared to to the turnover um, and you can only do that for a limited time only so you have to to be consequent and you have to to make hard decision which we did actually already um, because our clients uh, closed their hotels and uh, currently the investors are not really keen on building hotels at least they do not want to open them now. Um, so we we had to to let people go, and we also had to do good about in German. It means uh, we have a social system where the the country um, state pays uh, a quantity of of uh, yeah of unemployment. We can keep the the people half time, and then they get another let's say 30 percent from the government so that they in total they have 80 percent of their last income and they can survive um, for us it's it's good that we keep the people and that we still can do the service which our clients uh, require but it's very difficult to, to to communicate that to not to the outside there's a full understand, full understanding if there's a crisis that you have to do something but internally we we are now facing a home office uh, thing so we we are not together we cannot speak directly with the people communication is always via technology and it very often doesn't happen if it's critical so if people um, do not agree then they would not pick up the phone they you might meet them in the, in the office and, and can talk to them directly but um, with the home office it's it's a it's more difficult we do have a field good manager in our company and she is uh, very close to her colleagues and that helped a lot that uh, we were able to explain that people that we had to 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 leave away make to, yeah, to set apart, um, that there is no personal reason. That is only a reason that the whole company, as such, can survive. Um, and in principle, the people that still work with us are very happy, loyal, fine. And of course, those that had to go are kind of frustrated. I would have been frustrated also, but it is necessary. And and uh, the this this it is necessary. That's the the point we try to to repeat and repeat and repeat. Actually, there yeah. was a question from Catherine de Fontaine in the, in, the, in the chat, which I followed, and there was also the relation with the guests. What will guests expect after that crisis? And we're going to come back to that. Come back to that. Yes, we will, but, we'll come back to that. Yes, but I want to I want to discuss a little bit further about this whole employee matters and what hotels can do in relation to that. Um, I have heard about a number of hotels and and owners where they've basically taken this moment to use cross training for their staff or or retraining. Um, 
Bruno, what, what, what's your what's your view on this uh, training situation at the moment? Is this something that is um, is it a good time to be launching into into training for hotels? Absolutely, Taya, because again, as I said before, you as a hotelier have two key assets. The first one is the loyalty of, of your customers, but you only create the loyalty of your customers if you have good employees. That means uh, train them now, even uh, do some cross-training elements with them, meaning learning them about other other areas in your hotel, for example, from the service part to the f and or even in, in, into management areas, is now very, very valuable because, again, we always have to keep in mind, what are we selling in our industry? Basically, it's one single word, we are selling emotions. Of course, every 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 guest emphasizes uh, and experiences the emotions differently. And so therefore, it's so, so important that when the guest is coming to your house, he feels personally at home. And how that is, how that is uh, achieved, is always uh, according to what what how is your staff working, and the more this, your staff know, and I think this is right now the time. I think our industry was always fighting a little bit, in particularly the employees. Are you just working in the in the hospitality industry? Just working in the hospitality industry, like similarly, you are just working in the hospital. I think. Those two things are now changing significantly. First of all, I think the, the guys working in, in hospitals doing anyhow a great job. But I think also in our industry, we have now to emphasize and to enforce also the upgrade of, of the standing of our employees. And I think this is really now the, the time if you train your staff, you have those people available when doors are open again and guests are coming in and guests will uh, will feel welcome for from from the very first moment i think therefore it's absolutely essential if you can and many many uh, government programs are also facing towards that make use of that train your people show them what else is is is, is possible in your hotel and in the in the industry and you will be better off uh, when the doors are open again yeah, sure. Um, what about then um, further education? Um, Geert, I think you've been involved with some of the, the schools in, in Asia. And, and have you seen any sort of um, increase on, on further education, more through sort of online training that maybe hotels have been using or, or anything of that sort? Actually, I had uh, uh, four guest lecture engagements in, in January and February that were uh, obviously cancelled, um, hoping that that would happen in, in March. And quick discussion with the Dean, a test of Zoom, and those uh, those those guest lectures were done actually uh, very quickly on, on Zoom, and not small numbers either. One session was 260 students all dialing in from home to go from there to, well, let's do a full-fledged course on, let's say, project management or hotel opening management. Um, remote right online that's a small step it's just that people have to get uh, to terms with this is going to take a while we won't be standing in front of the uh, students uh, in the traditional sense right it's just a mindset change but it's it's not a a, a lesser experience actually yeah, yeah, we're getting a lot of really good uh, questions and comments coming in here. And one of the things is that it, it depends a lot on the location, depending on if you have sort of lockdowns or, or uh, whether the hotels are open or not. Um, Darlene and, and Alan, you're obviously both based in the US. Do you have sort of any any take on this in terms of, uh, I know it's not directly on your field of consultancy, but, but what's your pulse on the industry in terms of using this time for a training? Um, I'd say a lot of the hotels, and I don't know the exact percentage, I'm sure this is our stat that we can look at from this week, but a lot of the hotels are closed. Um, I'm not sure how much training is going on. The hotels that are open are, are only running with a very small skeleton staff. Yeah. Um, general manager of even a large full service hotel might be checking guests in and making beds and uh, cleaning toilets right now, doing whatever it takes to, yeah. to operate the hotel. So um, I'm not sure what they're doing in terms of training. Yeah, yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, I wanted to go back into one of the questions here, which I thought was a very good point about um, right now, there's been a lot of cuts that are directly taking out from the marketing budgets. Um, 
anybody want to, to take a, have a take on that question? Um, is that a good strategy right now that a lot of hotels are, are cutting out from their marketing budgets? What, what does that mean for the future when the guests eventually will come back? Can I? Go for it. Uh, I think it's, it's it's presumably the total wrong approach. Even when when many of the the, the, the audience will now say, "Chrono is crazy. We are not earning money," but and he's asking us for spending money. But you're I'm right. I'm referring to back by, by 20 years when the, when the dot com bubble exploded. Basically, in 2001, 2002, nobody out of the communication industry uh, really uh, spent money on on advertising. I was at that time in a company. Uh, uh, with, with internet, uh, TV, and telephony, and we spent money at that time. We had two two opportunities. The first opportunity was, I have to say, the, the offers were great from the from the various media houses to do advertisement, and and I think this is what we can uh, even the the people were open and, and and willing to receive ads at this time because for the first time they have time to do so. So. Mm -hmm. well, you read already the first marketing reports that, that the, the people staying at home are watching TV commercials all of a sudden anymore, reading news more intensively than in the past where only headlines were read. So cutting off marketing budgets uh, makes sense only for those things which are not your future target groups, but by redoing your marketing plan anyhow, and therefore, spending your marketing money, what is available to the best, to the best extent to your target group in media, is well spent money. Can I, okay, can I come in on that real quick on one second? One, yeah. one thing that we're seeing um, here in the U.S., or I actually saw the commercial on TV um, uh, last week sometime, is that although a lot of the hotel companies are cutting the marketing budgets, we're seeing places like Las Vegas um, launch national commercial ads um, showing pictures of the strip closed down with the hotel lights on, and and it it it, it looks um, it's a very odd odd view if you've ever been to Las Vegas to actually see the streets of the strip empty. Um, but places like Las Vegas and and even here in Colorado are starting to advertise commercials on TV that are put on by the the local jurisdictions and the cities and the states, and they're sending the message that when when the time comes and and this is past us, we're going to be ready to open and we're ready to to take you in. So at least here in the U.S., even if some of the individual hotels are cutting back on the marketing for big tourist or travel areas, we're seeing that the cities and the states stepping up and, and putting ads out there, um, letting yeah. us know that when the time comes, they're going to be ready, the hotels are going to be disinfected, and, and they're ready to, to get business back as usual. Yep, that's a good point. There's been really great uh, things coming up, actually, from different corners of the world, from Middle East, for example, uh, showing sort of the streets of Dubai being sterilized and how it's all going to be clean to the max, so then they're ready for you when, when things open up again. Um, one question, this is probably for you, Alan, so just to get you ready. Uh, there was a question about um, that technology upgrades in hotels can only happen if suppliers will be able to give good payment terms. So we're going a little bit into the, the sort of payment terms issues here. Um, have you seen or heard anything to, to this note? Well, as a purchasing agent, um, we're kind of in between all you know, 2,000 plus suppliers we deal with and all the different owners. And right now we're in a mode, one of the things that's very parallel to 2008, 2009. Of course, this is a very different situation, biological event, not a uh, financial crisis, economic event. But one thing that we are dealing with that is very similar, pretty much every vendor is worried that every one of our clients is not gonna be around, it's gonna go broke. Every client is worried that every vendor is going to go broke. And unfortunately, as was the case in 0809, some of them on both sides are going to be right. So it is a situation where, and I know that the title of this was how to enjoy the downtime. I'm not really enjoying the downtime. There's really no downtime. Every single transaction now is way more complicated than it was just you know a month ago, which, as I said, seems like a year ago. And um, it's really down to a specific relationship between one owner and one vendor and the credit worthiness on both sides and to go with your opening line, it's still cash is king. So the vendors that are well capitalized and have a good balance sheet um, are not you know, leveraged with maximum debt. Same thing on the owner side, those are the two parties that we're bringing together as best we can to, to do transactions now. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, 
Okay, I, I want to talk a little bit about the, let's say, personal side of things and how you can make use of the, the time. Quite right, like you said, Alan, I'm still waiting for the downtime to start. It hasn't really started in the consulting field, quite the opposite, but, but it may still come in the future. And, uh, and in the meanwhile, we're certainly not complaining. Um, Gert, I'm, I'm throwing this to you. I'm looking at you because you have been uh, in Asia for a long time. So you're obviously an, an opening process specialist and, and work, work out of Macau there. And, um, and you've survived a lot of the crises that there's been. So you've had the obviously global financial crisis, the SARS, the mid 90s uh, financial crisis in Asia. What's your sort of, on a more personal side of things, what's your takeaway from these as a professional? Any sort of tips that you can give for our um, listeners who are wondering, how am I gonna get through this personally? Because this is just really tough. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I think the toughest year was actually uh, being a general manager during SARS in Hong Kong. Now, from start to finish, uh, it, it was only six months, if you look back, right? What is six months? You know, that's that's two quarters. You're, you're halfway there for the year-end budget. But when you're in it, it's it's bleak, and it's like it's not going to end. The news is negative. Uh, everyone is talking about it. So uh, three things that I do is, first of all, I only look at the news 10 minutes in the morning and the rest of the day. Don't look at it. Second, extra sport, right? It's very important to maintain a physical health. So I run 10, 10K every morning. Normally, that will be just five. And then, of course, uh, spend personal time. Uh, read a book, uh, do a study, and um, maintain that, that mental health as well, right? Uh, to get through this period um, will require discipline, of course. There's no telling how long this will take. But if you, if you mentally prepare yourself that you're going to be not able to travel, uh, is going to take six months. It will help you to get into a routine and that will help you to cope better with it. And we've been yeah. in this now since uh, basically January. Uh, so far, so good. Um, of course, we're not on, on lockdown at home. We can still go out. There's a few restrictions, so it's not as bad as in some other countries, but still, Macau is a small place and it can get to you if you uh, don't have your mindset in order. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it's all about managing expectations, like like all things in life. And I think at the moment we all have a, quite a job managing our own expectations on, on how to deal with this this situation. Um, Peter, we're going to come now to this, this question that uh, you mentioned earlier here from Catherine, which was relating to, to the, the sort of um, future travel and how is this whole uh, current environment possibly impacting people's values and um, and their approach to life with we've, we've obviously come from this lifestyle of 24 7 and then suddenly we're all locked in our homes we have more time in our hands and there's a lot of soul searching going when, when people are a little bit evaluating their life and yeah. um, what's your take on this are we going to see a, a sort of total change on on people's values and how is that going to impact travel maybe not a, a total change but a, a, the the value change definitely speeds up um, there have been lots of changes already in the, in the society that slowly appeared and they might have grown, but now they explode. As we have time now, Bruno said you should write your marketing uh, plan newly, but you can also write a book and you have the time to do any other thing that, that uh, your, your hobbies or whatever, because with a crisis, you're, you're just spend it for, for that time. You cannot do anything on your job or not much. So you have to spend the time somehow in a good sense. And, and I think the values must change, definitely. You, you, you see that uh, the job is not 100% of your life. There are other things also. Um, for me, it's cooking as you can see probably. Uh, so I do a lot of cooking and um, I enjoy that a lot. And uh, other people might write a book, but uh, having the, that time to think about what you really like, what you really want to do, will probably also change the mindset of, our, of the guests, of the hotels, of our guests. Um, so I could well imagine that uh, in future, the experiences that, that guests are looking for are maybe a little bit different more be probably more into the direction of uh, mindfulness of, of uh, self-exploring um, 
ideas that come up now and probably will be stronger in future. Yeah, okay. Um, I see a, another good question here coming from uh, Kevin Murphy asking a little bit more about the hotel management agreement and how that's going to kind of uh, play out in the post-COVID-19 environment. And I, I think the the simple answer on that is that we're going to see a lot of changes on, on how contracts are drafted and, and also what type of contracts are drafted. Um, anyone specifically from the panel want to want to comment on that, on the sort of future of HMAs? Hot topic. No, not really. They will be renegotiated, I would say. Uh, just like someone who is currently out of a job would go to the bank and uh, renegotiate uh, the bank loan, right? Uh, what what yeah. will rates yeah, be yeah. like? Yeah, and, and rates will determine what can you afford in terms of management fees. Let's leave it at yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There is certainly already a lot of discussion taking between um, owners and uh, management companies and and lenders as well, for that matter. But um, but I think we're hopefully going to have a healthier future in terms of the the contract landscape. Um, I want to ask one thing from each of you to to sort of um, reflect back on the, the past months of your lives, and and um, I'd like to get one thing from each of you. And what is it that that you have learned or that you're already doing, how you're making a, a use of this sort of time, hopefully, that you have to, to make sort of a, make yourself a little bit better as a, as a professional and, and also for the personal use. Um, anybody want to want to start? I could. I, as I said, I, I love cooking, so I do, I do that in the moment. <laughs> But there's a long, longer term thinking uh, behind it also. Uh, as, I'm, as I'm becoming 60, 63 now, I, I have to think about retiring and I could never imagine what I should do after uh, being 100% working for the company. But as we have new partners now, and uh, I had to face the situation with uh, getting slower in the, in the business, uh, I can imagine now to do less, to probably then travel more uh, uh, and maybe do more cooking, maybe write a book. That was the, the point I took from Bruno. That was something I wanted to do all the time. But I've learned that uh, the business is not 100% what you need to do. Yeah. What about Dali? Any what, what what have you been uh, up to to make use of this time? Um, well, I would say the two things stand out in my head a, a little bit. One on the professional side, um, and, and I'm 43, which I still consider myself very young, but I have a lot of uh, younger people that work for me that are way more into technology than what I've been in. And even though Audit Logistics, my company, is one of the leading technology companies in the logistics world, I've really learned how important technology is. We're going on our fourth week from working not in the office. And I'm amazed every day at the communications that I'm able to have with all the 54 employees that we've got um, in four different offices around the world and, and just really taken back at, at how important the technology is, especially with everybody um, working remotely. Um, and, and then from a personal side, it, you know, kind of like Peter, I'm, I'm trying to, to take advantage of some of the things that I miss out on by traveling all the time or, or going to the office. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a very early person in the morning. I, I generally leave from my house to go to the office um, when it's dark just about every day. And since I've been home, I've really been able to appreciate, I, I live in 9,000 feet in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. Um, and just being able to sit out on our deck in the morning with my husband and have a cup of coffee and watch the sun come up is something that for the last 20 years we've been married, I've never done. Um, and so I'm really starting to appreciate some of those simpler things um, and, and appreciating what I have with all the time that we're spending at home now. Sure. Alan, any thoughts? Sure. Um, on the professional side and spending a lot of time with our uh, marketing business development team, you know, redoing things like the website, uh, RFP responses and things that you're always too busy to try and really take a good look under the hood and retool and, and uh, check over everything. On the personal side, I'm the opposite of Peter. I can barely boil water, so I cannot cook at all. But I'm married to a lady that's a phenomenal cook. And for a guy who is Normally, I don't think I've been at home since we've been married 30 days in a row ever. Um, this time frame, it's probably going to be 90 days uh, in a row home. So I'm enjoying that, not uh, road food, phenomenal uh, home-cooked meals. And to try and balance that 
working out with uh, my son and daughter and uh, my son who's 14 is now getting stronger than me. So I better start working out a little bit more, trying to balance out all the way. It will get worse. <laughs> <laughs> what about Geta? What's your sort of, uh, what have you learned? What are you doing now? That opportunities come from um, uh, very unexpected angles. I mean, I did a guest lecture from one, from for one university, and they called me back and and asked to join the the, the faculty in order to uh, roll out programs on project management and and hotel opening management, which is actually very um, rewarding to do that for two reasons. Um, it, it's our responsibility, of course, to share. Uh, with people that are currently in, in hotel schools and a little bit of self-serving of course as well because the projects that had already started are only on hold. They will restart afterwards and we'll need qualified people that are currently in school uh, in order to fill those positions, right? So uh, other than that, uh, Peter, uh, I already wrote a book but I'm translating it into German all for you, you know? Great. And I know how to cook we're already. Ready. <laughs> We're ready for the Chinese the version. The now, that, that was done a long time ago. <laughs> okay, and, and Bruno, finally from you, any, any final thoughts on that? Yes, of course, I think the first thing what, what, what we are doing when it comes to professional part of you, internally reworking on, on the website and a few procedures, but what we're also doing, simply calling our customers for, for, a, for a normal talk, because our customers in that respect have the feelings the emotions we have they have a fear of about the future so exchanging it uh, is, is i think is, is and talking about i think is a very very positive attitude to both sides we learn they learn and when it comes to to the private po point of view is here i could join with with peter when he is cooking I'm learning uh, on wine because my, my wife is a wine sommelier and becoming a wine academic. And so therefore, what you see here is one of, of, of the things I'm, I'm learning all about wine. So, Peter, we are joining forces. We are right to Thank So we are restaurant together. And I deliver the wine. So I think what it's all about, staying in contact with, with customers who are becoming friends and anyhow staying in contact also privately with friends and family which are things in the past we always had no time, in a hurry, I have to rush there, I have to fly there, I have to be there. I think this is now what we can enjoy, what we can really emphasize and learn about it. What is really, it, it, it's a phrase of course, but we have to live it, what is really important in life. And I think we all, and, and I think many in the audience uh, listening to us will, will agree with that. We are all learning that Job is important, but you only can do your job perfectly well if you're at the end of the day balanced with, with your body, so to say. Uh, if, yeah. if you are sure. middle, middle grounded, missing out an English word for it. Yeah, finding the balance on, um, on everything. Um, okay, um, I think we we will wrap up this session because we are moving. I invite everyone to go go and uh, move to the uh, stage because we will have there the the final words from Jonathan Worsley, and I think we can all agree that it's been a great effort from uh, Bench Events to to put together this conference on on such a short notice. Um, I thank you all for joining. I, I thank the the panelists for being part of this. Um, please take all good care. Stay united. Stay strong. Stay positive. Positive and um, and like Bruno said, there try to, to find a good balance in um, in making the good use of this time, so you can come out of strong when we come out of this. Thank you. Thank you, Tia. Thank, thank you, yes. thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.